Welcome back to Taxation is Theft Fest 2020, you guys. I am your host, Dre, and I am about to welcome Norma Jean Almondovar. I was trying to figure out how to say that name properly. I hope I'm doing it okay. Um, Norma Jean was once employed as um, an LAPD traffic officer. She then turned call girl, and in 86, she was the California candidate for lieutenant governor. Since then, she's been an activist for sex worker rights since she left the LAPD in 82, and she currently runs a nonprofit organization dedicated to changing the laws, which make her and her colleagues outlaws. Let's welcome Norma Jean. Hi there. <laughs> uh, you, you said my name okay. It's Amadovar, but who cares? It was my first husband's last name, and I don't care how you butcher oh. it. Well, then, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad I caught a couple minutes of the earlier discussion about uh, candidates because in, in 86, I mean, it was kind of like for a lot of people having a prostitute run for lieutenant governor of California. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was, it was a lot rather of pearl clutching. Unique. Hmm? A lot of pearl clutching back then. A lot of that. Yes, yes. Including in the Libertarian Party. But thankfully, I was nominated. And the sole purpose for running was to eliminate the office of Lieutenant Governor of California, which was a superfluous office. But also because if I had won the candidacy and if I'd been elected, then when the governor was out of town, I could have pardoned myself and not gone to prison. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> Two for one, you know, get rid of the office and pardon myself. That would have been um, a nice little double feature for you then it see your have, way out. It would have. Yes, indeed. So, okay. So what do you want to start out with? I mean, you know, what I do now, what I did, why I'm a libertarian, why I believe in freedom. Um, well, let's, um, let's talk about uh, what you and your organization do to uh, change the laws and like where we are with that as far as like, in because it's a state thing, right? Yeah, yeah the, all prostitution laws are state laws. And of course, it's only legal in Nevada in some counties. And sex worker rights activists like myself uh, and all over the world, we want decriminalization. We don't want legalization. We want the government to stay out of what we do with our own bodies, whether it's for money or whether it's just having loads of sexual encounters with lots of males, females, trans, whatever we want to do. So can you tell people out there who may not know the difference, what's the difference, why you would rather have it decriminalized rather than legalized? Right. Well, what happens in a legalized system is that you make, you enact new and special laws that only apply to people in the sex industry. Whereas a decriminalization removes all criminal penalties for consenting adult commercial sex, leaves intact all laws which apply to anybody else in any other profession, such as you can't have sex with children, you can't rape, um, you know, so if you work for a, an employer, they can't steal your money, um, they can't abuse you, those laws all stay in place. Unfortunately, if you legalize prostitution and you enact new and special laws, it leads back to the same problem that we have now, and that is that the police use the laws to rape, extort, and pimp prostitutes as they've done ever since prostitution became a crime. And that's what we want to avoid. I mean, it doesn't mean that uh, sex workers can work on your street corner necessarily. I mean, there are places, for example, in Europe where there are special zones for those who wish to work on the street. I mean, street prostitution is a very small percentage of all sex work. I mean, the majority of sex workers work for themselves. They work for madams. They work in brothels. They advertise on the internet. There, I mean, there's just so many ways in which we do our work. I mean, you have people that work in, you know, spas, just all of these things. And we represented when I was working, the majority of people who work in sex work. So because people think, oh my gosh, you know, street work, I don't want to have a prostitute on my street corner. Well, understandable. I don't want to have a church on my street corner. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, I don't want to have people out there passing out tracks when I'm trying to get to the grocery store or something. It's like, okay, there's a time and a place for these things. And, you know, not necessarily 
where people are in public. Um, so we want to decriminalize consenting adult commercial sex, as I said. And obviously, we don't want minors in the prostitution any more than they should be doing a lot of other things. Although, of course, I started working not as a prostitute, but I was a waitress from the time I was 14 until I, was, until I graduated from high school. But nevertheless, sex work is not a job for minors. It really is not. Sure, right. I think we can all agree on that. Yeah. So, okay, so that's one of the things I do. But um, in the last few, sorry, you can see my cat. <laughs> no, that's your cat. I have a cat. <laughs> I saw. <laughs> I saw I your have... black cat. I have two black cats that are sitting here by me. So there you go. One is there and Aww. one is there. So they're being, being, being good. Okay, so back in 2012, I mean, I started my nonprofit organization in uh, 1997. And through the years, it's kind of not necessarily shifted in focus, but it's become something bigger than it was just the art and culture for sex workers. It became more educational because we were getting all of this nonsense from the radical feminists who kept saying, you know, all prostitution is sex trafficking and and there's 100,000 to 300,000 children being trafficked into prostitution every year. And I'm like, mm, I, I don't, I don't think so. So I started to do the math. In fact, um, I'm going to screen share and show you what I, what I do. Hold on a second. Okay. Screen share. Let's see. What do I do? Um, it's okay. Screen share. There we are. And let's see which part you want to see. We want. Uh, okay. I want to share, but I want to see here. Can you see that? Can you see it? Uh, no, I, I, I can't. I'm not oh. sure that uh, that works with. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, he told me to do screen share. Okay, so oh. screen sharing. Which, uh, if Zach told you to do it, then go for it. Well, I mean, if you can, if you can't see it, I don't know because I just, I just started doing the math on all of their. Yeah, we're back in the show. Okay, um, on all the statistics that are being touted out there. And the thing is, when you look at both the um, numbers from police every year, I, I have a website called police prostitution and politics.com. It's an ancillary to the ice face, the international sex worker foundation for art, culture and education website. And it's where I post all of the information, all the statistics from the FBI they're not my statistics, they're the government statistics. And what people don't know is, for example, from 2014 to 2018, the total number of sex traffic cases of minors was 90. 90. 2014, wow. there were six. 2015, there were three. 2016, there were 49. 2017, there were 14. In 2018, there were 18. So you cannot extrapolate from those numbers and get 100,000 to 300,000 children every year. You can't. I mean, it's like you got to do the math. Now, the other thing is on, on that same vein, um, when you, when you look at the government numbers on police, prostitution, and politics.com, you can see operation do the math for each year that I've done them. You can see state by state how many arrests for all prostitution have been made from 1981, I believe, is when I, I started getting the numbers together all the way up to 2018 because the 2019 statistics don't come out until December, or excuse me, October of this year. And then I'll do the, those numbers again. But from two, 1981 to 2018, you look at the numbers of, of and, and they have gone number of arrests. They only started counting the sex traffic victims in 2000. There's another kitty. Um, in 2014. So before that, they didn't have them. But I have the numbers for all the prostitution arrests. And minors constituted 1.81% of all arrests for prostitution. And they have been and they still are arresting children under 10. For prostitution. Why are they arresting them? I don't know, but they arrest them. 
And so what, what we did, you know, put all these numbers out there and say, whenever you get these abolitionists talking about all of these hundreds of thousands of, you know, sex traffic children and adults, because all of us adults, we were all trafficked because we, we can't possibly choose to engage in prostitution right now, of course. Right. Um, you know, because I mean, we're too fucking stupid. Excuse my language. I'm sorry. Oh, you're fine. This is <laughs> I, a free speech zone. I swear. Zone. Um, we're too stupid to know that we're being trafficked. It's like, um, but here, my thought on it is on a scale of one to 10, if murder is the worst thing you can do to your fellow human being, isn't giving them an orgasm like way up there, like a 10 and, and getting paid on top of that, like, you know, a lot of money. I mean, when I was working, I was working as a call girl. Okay. And on my best date with a client, I made $10,000 stay with him for overnight um, and dress him up like a woman. We never had sex. One night. One night. Yeah. So what is a call girl? Is that when you have a madam and she takes and she has, for you? Yeah. She, uh, working as a call girl, I worked through a number of different madams because I started in my thirties. I was, you know, like 31 when I started in, in sex work and I wasn't tall. I wasn't blonde, you know, I, so I had to work for a bunch of different madams who would find me the clients that would like the type of woman that I am, you know, short and all that. Um, and so, yes, they would find a client for me. They would call me up and say, Hey, Norma Jean, I've got this guy and um, this is his fantasy and this is how much he pays. And, you know, you can go have lunch with him if you want to first and get to know him and see if you guys are right for each other. And so, I mean, that was to me, that was the way to work. And it was a 60, 40 split. She got 40%. I got 60%. So, and then after I saw the client for a few times, then he was you know, I didn't have to split money with her at all. So it was, I mean, for me, it was the best way to work in sex work. But not everybody is fortunate enough to find a, a, a madam to work for who is ethical. And I mean, because there are people in the sex industry, just like there are in any other businesses. There are people that are ethical and there are people that are not. And I just happened to find a number of madams. There was only one madam that I just absolutely would not work for after the first time she sent me to somebody that wanted a blonde and oh, I'm not a blonde. So <laughs> never have been, never will be. So, um, you know, the guy says, well, you're not a blonde. And I'm like, no kidding. <laughs> So I, I walked out on that one. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, be the wrong person for you. So, but anyway, I, that was, that's working as a call girl. There's just so many things in between. I mean, there's so many women that, and men and trans people that advertised on the internet, on Backpage, on Craigslist, and they would find a client that was appropriate, they would be able to screen that person and see whether or not that person is an actual person. That's the real name. And, and you, you know, get to know so that when you go to your uh, date with that person, you're as safe as anybody could be. I mean, a lot safer than when I worked for the LAPD and was out there at nighttime in a patrol car all by myself with no gun and no partner. Cause I was only a little old traffic officer. We didn't have no guns. We didn't have no partners. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was dangerous. I worked from six at night to two, three, four, five o'clock in the morning. And I would be at the scene of homicides. I, you know, I drug traffic, um, you know, gave tickets. And I'll, don't even get me started on that. I mean, <laughs> I feel so bad and I'm so ashamed of all those tickets. I mean, I, they called me the bionic arm because I gave out so many tickets. But you see, I thought, well, I'm getting paid for this. This is what I'm supposed to do. So I gave a lot of tickets and I apologize to all those people to whom I gave a ticket. You didn't deserve it. Well, you did, but you know, <laughs> government shouldn't be doing that in the first place. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just, my mind is still blown that they had you out there at those hours with I, no gun. I know. And as, that was back, you know, in the, in the seventies and there were no police uh, female police officers at that time. You could be a police woman, but you didn't work on the street. And you had to be 5'7", and I'm 5'4". Ain't going to grow up any taller. And uh, so there I am out there at nighttime because they started a pilot program in order to see whether or not women would be able to be trusted in police cars and patrol cars and work those hours. So I was kind of a guinea pig for them. Oh. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, I encountered so many 
really weird situations and it was very dangerous. But you see, I had a big mouth and I just, you know, basically anybody give me a trouble, I like fuck up, Buster. <laughs> so, but anyway, so it was a, it was a, a very interesting experience. I stayed there much too long. I was there for 10 years and I saw so much corruption within the LAPD and I just, I had to leave. I mean, these guys, they had a burglary ring, a murder for hiring, a yacht theft ring, a drug ring. They were running call girls. Um, they were having sex with prostitutes uh, on duty, off duty. I mean, it was just like paint and place. I don't know if that reference means anything to you. That used to be like a soap opera. Oh, okay. So <laughs> the police were all doing this while you were on the force? Yep. yep. Oh, wow. Yep. That sounds like something right out of a movie. A I, yeah, I know. Well, it, it was all happening. And I, I just, I was like totally freaked out. I said, how can I work for these guys? It's like working for the Blue Mafia. And so on um, April 18th of 1982, I was driving my patrol car up Hollywood Boulevard. I was hit by a drunk driver in a stolen car with stolen property. And that was my third on-duty accident. I said, that's it, I've had enough. So I went, to, after I got out of the hospital for x-rays and stuff, I went home like four o'clock in the morning and I tore up my uniform and I cut up my shoes and I'm not going back. And I didn't. Good and so you. I had to find something to do and to earn a living. And I knew a call girl from when I was on the LAPD and I went to her, she introduced me to her madam. I was like, there you go. So I started working and I was like, the best job I ever had, bar none. Now that sounds also like something out of a movie. I used to be a cop. I called this call girl who I used to talk to when I was on the force. <laughs> hey, I'm not on the force anymore. Can you hook me up? <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully it will be a movie someday because you know, I wrote a book, Cop to Call Girl. Oh, and wow. it, well, see, I, it's, it's a long story. I went to prison actually for writing that book. What happened is I'd been writing a book about all of the adventures I had on the LAPD. Then I became a call girl and I incorporated those stories into my new life of call girl. So the book is called Cop to Call Girl, Why I Left the LAPD to Make an Honest Living as a Beverly Hills Prostitute. Well, the police found out I was writing a book and it's a long story. You'd have to go on, on Amazon and get the book. It's Cop to Call Girl and you can still get it on Amazon. Um, Anyway, they found out about the book. They set me up with a friend of mine from the department. They charged me with one count of pandering. They confiscated all of my notes relating to my book. And um, I went on trial in 1984. I was convicted of one count of pandering, which is simply encouraging a person to commit an act of prostitution. It is a felony in California with a mandatory three to six year prison term on the first offense with no prior convictions. You can commit rape, robbery, assault, mayhem, and murder. And if you don't use a gun, you can get probation. But if you try to get some chick's ass laid for money, and I was paying for the day because she was very unattractive. She was 50 years old, six foot two, weighed about 200, no, 300 pounds. And um, she had fantasized about being a call girl. She was my friend on the LAPD. And I felt bad for her. So I had a client that liked taller, older women. And I told her that, you know, I'll be happy to set you up so you can fulfill your fantasy. And I told my client about it. And he goes, I'm sorry, but no, thank you. So I um, offered to pay him. I uh, said, I'll give you the money to see her with. And so that was the date that I arranged for her. And unfortunately, she was setting me up. And when I went to trial, uh, she said under oath on the witness stand, the reason she set me up was to stop me from writing an expose on Los Angeles police. Those were the words in the newspaper article the next day. Officer testifies she wants to stop Call Girl's book. So what are you going to do? So what happened is that my attorney decided not to bother to defend me. So he waived everything and rested. I got convicted of one count of pandering. The judge decided to go around the mandatory law and he sent me to prison for a psychiatric evaluation for 50 days. Um, the outcome of that was that I wasn't dangerous to anybody. I was in solitary confinement for 50 days 
And when I got out, the judge says, okay, you're not dangerous. I'm going to put you on probation. And at the time, the DA said they wouldn't appeal the sentence. Unfortunately, I wouldn't shut up. I mean, I kept getting on every talk show there was. I, I've been literally on about 2,500 radio and TV shows, Joan Rivers six times, Donahue five times, Oprah, um, Geraldo, Montel Williams, you name it. I've been on those shows. Wow. And the, 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 the DA and the cops were like, God damn it, she won't fucking shut up. And so the district attorney appealed my sentence a year later, just about a year later. And they said the reason they were appealing it is because my crime was worse than rape or robbery because I was commercially exploiting my law enforcement past to draw on scandalous escapades that undermine respect for the law. And so that's when, once they appealed it, that's when I decided I haven't been loud enough yet so I better do something else. And that's when one of my, one of, I have a lot of brothers and sisters and one of my brothers was out here and he had a friend who was in the Libertarian Party and he said, why don't you run for Lieutenant Governor? I was okay, why not? I mean, I, obviously I haven't been loud enough, so let's get louder. So um, then I went to the convention in California, the state convention, and I got the nomination and I ran and I did these really outstanding posters, which, you know, I'm nude in one with red tape around me and one's got a whose life is it anyway, you know, thing. So we did three different posters and um, I got over 100,000 votes, which was not bad for a convicted felon hooker. So, but unfortunately, the appellate court overturned my probation after serving two years and seven months of violation free probation. My sentence was overturned and I was resentenced to three years in state prison, where I was with the Manson family, women, and other notorious murderesses. So, all because I wouldn't shut up. Did you have to serve the full three years? I served 18 months in prison and then I went, I was on parole. So I served 50 days of solitary, two years and seven months probation, 18 months in prison and 18 months on parole, all for trying to fulfill my friend's fantasy. Nothing took place. The only thing that happened was words, conversation. That was right. it. So unbelievable. Well, if they really want to get you, they'll figure out a way. They will. That's government yeah. for you. <laughs> You know, she went, the judge went around it the first time for you. And then, yep. oh man. Well, the, the good thing was that even while in prison, I didn't shut up. 60 Minutes came in and interviewed me. So I was on 60 Minutes. And then all these radio stations wanted to interview me from prison. So I did like 32 radio interviews from my, my dorm in prison. And it's like, God damn bitch. God, can't we shut her up while she's there? Ah! Well, you know, if they, I guess they could have like not allowed them in, right? They like, could not allow them in. They couldn't. No. I had a constitutional right to have, to speak to the media, to make sure that I stayed safe because I was really afraid that it was very possible that somebody that was a lifer in prison might get some favors for the family if somehow we got in a brawl or something and I ended up dead. So so the media saved my life while I was in prison. So That's, you've lived an amazing life. I'm glad you. It is that. enough for yet. I mean, I'm an old lady now, but. <laughs> so anyway, so back to the, you know, I I was a delegate to the women's conference, the UN women's conference in in Beijing, China, 1995. Um, and we, we actually, the, there were five sex workers there. We were NGO delegates and we lobbied to change the wording of the platform for action. I don't know if you know what that is, the platform for action. It's a, it's a document that every time the, these organizations have this international conference, they work out the details <laughs> for the next, uh, platform for action, which all member countries are supposed to ratify. So one of the uh, planks of the platform said, all prostitution is incompatible with the dignity and worth of the human person and must be eliminated. Well, considering the laws that we currently have and the outrageous penalties for just saying words, I mean, can you imagine if this were really enforced where all must be eliminated? What are they gonna do, shoot us? <laughs> <laughs> 
probably. Um, but anyway, so we, we got the um, platform changed by one word. It says all forced prostitution is incompatible with the dignity and worth of the human person. And we absolutely agree with that. Unfortunately, at the same time, the radical feminists were there, the people like Melissa Farley and a few other nutbags, abolitionists, and they said, oh, but all prostitution is forced because women would never choose to be prostitutes. And they may say they are, but they're all brainwashed. Wow. So anyway, so we went, we, we did this amazing thing. We came back and... And the radical feminists had persuaded the media and the media got involved and they said, it's all sex trafficking. There's no difference between child and adult prostitution. There's no difference between forced and free choice. It's all forced, it's all sex trafficking and we must eliminate it. And that's why you have the most hideous laws like the Foster sesta law, which was passed by these people who believe they were doing something good to help the children and us poor stupid fucking adults so anyway it's it's i mean it's, it's been a very interesting life will i run for office again no i got too many other things i have to do i have too many other books to write i've got a book that i've been working on called the dishonored badge broken trust the immoral consequences of so-called moral laws which obviously goes to show all the different crimes i mean i have so many cases of cops who do all those things not just la all over the country all over the world. And it's because we have vice laws that many of these cops feel that they can they can do these things to people because it's like, hey, if you don't want me to arrest you for giving a blowjob for whatever, then you're going to have to give me a blowjob. Uh, you know, just whatever it is, as long as we have these laws that mandate morality, we have police corruption. And it's really, we've got to stop allowing government to give these kinds of laws to corruptible human beings. So, absolutely. So, do you feel safe writing these books now? You know, I, if they want to come after me, they can. I have I have a sign on my doors. If you come in my house, I have cameras all over the place in here. So if they want to come in and try to hassle me again, you know, it's going to be on tape and it's going to be broadcast. But, I, you know, one never knows. But I think they've learned their lesson to leave me alone. So because I, I just don't so. shut up. Well, it's been so long. Like, I would hope that you have enough distance from people that were on the force then. They probably aren't still on the force, right? Oh, no, they're not on the force anymore. But I, as long as I continue to harass law enforcement, I get I get people who really don't like what they're doing to be exposed. They just, you know. So is it possible? It's possible. I hope it's not. I stay at home. I take care of my, my disabled husband. He became disabled in 2007 and I'm his caregiver. So I don't go out much. Talk about, you know, people, people are in lockdown. I've been in lockdown since 2007. Ain't no big deal. So anyway, you got more questions. You want me to Oh, this is your time. Um, I don't have any from the audience as of right now. So if you have some more things that you want to talk about, please feel free. Uh, again, it's up to you. We can cut it short or we can keep going up to you. Oh, I have, I mean, I, I lecture at colleges and universities where I did. I even do lectures, of course, on Skype, but I, I, um, I speak at AIDS conferences at, um, American medical association conferences, because to me, one of the important things is of course, practicing safe sex and people don't know that sex workers actually have been practicing safe sex for a long time um so speaking to a a, a america american medical students association and telling them look if you're gonna if you're gonna treat sex workers for issues you know whether it's uh, uh health issues or whatever else you need to know what we already do and what we already know and not presume that we're just ignorant and we just you know we don't use condoms and we don't do, practice safe sex because we absolutely do i mean we were using condoms long before it became a big deal for the rest of society before aids became an issue so because i got into sex work in 1982 
and uh, you know it's like okay if i'm going to do this i have to protect myself i have to protect my body um because i don't want any diseases i mean here's the thing you know when i was on the lapd i was screwing a lot of cops and cops thought making love was like using their gun all they had to do was take aim and shoot and most couldn't get it out of the holster before it went off so i didn't practice safe sex back then because it was over too quickly <laughs> But anyway, um, when I got into sex work, taking care of my body became an extremely important issue for me. And so speaking at colleges and universities, I gave them some tips on how sex workers practice safe sex. And some of them had to do with how to put a condom on a guy where he's, you know, doesn't know it while you're giving him a blow job or whatever. Um, all kinds of really interesting ways to protect yourself. You can have faux intercourse by putting your hands underneath you, make sure they're well lubricated and letting him have sex with your hand. N not know it. But, I mean, I had a lot of, I, most of my clients, I had a lot of clients. I'll give you a couple of great stories from my sex worker past. I had a client that fantasized about Julia Child. That you know was, who she was, right? Yes, that awful okay, voice. Well, what yes but his fantasy involved this this whole elaborate scenario where i had to go to um farmer's market and get a chicken from a particular butcher then i would take it to his house and go upstairs and take off my clothes and put on an apron not nude but just an apron and go down in the kitchen and I, but in order to do this i had to teach myself how to talk like julia child so i went to the, my husband went to the library and got me some videos of her cooking and so i practiced that so i could do this now this is kind of an elaborate fantasy so he knew that it wasn't just like he couldn't call somebody up and say hey send me somebody that can talk like julia child so the madam that i worked for that had this client she told me what he wanted and you know if i had to practice i could do that so i did so i go to his house and like i said get an an apron and go down the kitchen he had everything all prepared for me he had like cream and and a chicken breast and all that <clears throat> and then he'd sit on the stool and he'd be masturbating while i would talk and i said <clears throat> let's see if i could do this this is Julia Child. Today I'm going to take this nice, firm, meaty breast and I'm going to pour hot juices over this chicken breast and I'm going to take the meat and I'm going to roll it in this flour. And so this is what I did. And he paid $500 for this, by the way. Just It was not a long session. There was no intercourse for me whatsoever. It was just simply talking like Julia Child. And um, so while I was basting the bird, he was getting the stuffing ready, if you will. Gotcha. <laughs> so, I mean, that was one of the many different things that, that had nothing to do with having intercourse. I had clients that were, they fantasized they were my sex slaves. And I would, one client, he I mean, he was a long-term client. I had him till he died whenever, a few number of years ago. Um, he wanted to be my sex slave so i would tie him up put you know a blinder over him and then he saw me in my home sometimes i would see him at his house sometimes at my house but if he was at my house i'd tie him up in the bed with the mask on so he couldn't see so it was dark and i'd tell him what i was going to do when i came back and i'm gonna you know i'm gonna beat you up i'm gonna do. and then i would go in the other room and work on my book and then I would come back and, you know, like half an hour and say, I know that you've been moving your body. You better not, you naughty slave. And I'd spank him. So, I mean, that's really safe sex. So it was the Julia Child safe sex. So, but I, mean, I had a lot of clients like that that were just into these elaborate fantasies. Clients that had foot fetishes and just simply wanted to masturbate on my feet in my five inch heels. So, you know, as long as they didn't ruin my stockings, I was okay. So anyway, but, um, you know, I, I stopped working probably in my, you know, because after I came home from prison, I couldn't work for a while, obviously, because I was on parole. 
And uh, I wouldn't break the law again while I was on parole. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that, would I? Ever, ever. Mm -mm. You can take of that what you will. <clears throat> but um, because, you know, I know the government means business and it says you shouldn't commit prostitution. And, oh, I wouldn't do that. But anyway, um, I saw a lot of really interesting clients and I had mm, a number of them were my clients for the entire time I was working, which was from the age of 31 till probably my early 50s. Oh, wow. So that's dedication. Yeah. Well, they were like my, they, they loved me. I mean, I was, I was their warrior whore goddess. So, so who was your favorite and why? Who was your favorite? Client? Oh God, I don't know if I had, I had so many really neat clients. I had some movie star clients. I had producers. I could name you oh, names wow. and you know who I was talking about, but I'm not going to kiss. I don't kiss and tell. Oh, no, no, no. I just, so. I'm, I'm curious about like, you know, like those are just interesting fantasies. Like I want to watch you cook in an apron yeah. and talk like Julia Child. Like, you got to be you very fine tuned to like Julie Child's voice. Well, you do. But I mean, I can I can just imagine what took place in his head when he was a child. Maybe maybe he was like listening to television and he heard her talk about breasts and he got all excited about breasts and firm and meaty. You know, it's like so now he grows up and that's that's stuck in his head is like that's really sexy. So I had one client, the one that I made $10,000 with, his fantasy was that he was a lesbian call girl. I never had sex with him. He would, I would take my, my bag of lingerie for men because you see, if they tried on my lingerie, I was short and small and they would have ruined it. So I had a bag of clothes of lingerie for my clients that were bigger. And so he would go through the bag and pull out the things that he wanted me to dress him in. And I'd put on, you know, this one and that one. But he had the worst taste in, in colors. He'd have like an orange bra and red panties and a garter belt that was pink or black. And it's like, then then I would sit and tell him how beautiful. Oh, yeah, I put makeup on him. I said how beautiful he was. And I'm like, oh, yes, those women in Beverly Hills, they're going to love you. You're going to hide in the closet in this apartment that didn't exist. Because, you see, we had to have like a really high end, very expensive apartment where we saw our women clients and um so i i tell him all i just spin this yarn for him and and he go well well who who is it that we're seeing and he'd give me names of some famous women i say yeah oh she she came over and oh we had the best time and she, you were in the closet and and then i pulled you out of the closet and she's like oh god she's so beautiful i just love her and i was like Okay, whatever. So this, I saw him several times, but this one night he didn't want to stop. So I, it's like every time it was time for us, for me to go, he'd say, well, if you stay another hour or if you stay two hours, I'll, I'll give you another $2,000. So that happened all night long until it was six o'clock in the morning and I had $10,000. I'm like, okay, I got to go. I can't stay awake any longer. I don't do drugs. He was doing Coke, but I don't do anything. I don't even drink coffee. So I had to go home, but it was like <sighs> safe sex. What else you can call it? Right. He so, wanted an elaborate storyteller. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of what sex work is about. It's about creating a fantasy in somebody's head. It's, it's not about necessarily wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Here's your money out the door. It's, it's, you create some relationships with your clients as a call girl. And, and a lot of times for the sex workers that work on the internet, I mean, I don't know necessarily how, how much it, you, would do that with clients that you meet on the street. But I know that there are women who have, and men who would find their clients on the street and they would see them more than one time. So, but see, I mean, you can still get a copy of my book on Amazon and read some of the fantasies in there. Cause I had some, I had this, Oh yeah, I should tell you this one too. I had a, I worked for a male madam for a brief period of time, just like a madam. He wasn't a pimp. Well, legally he's a pimp, but, and then so were the madams, but he wanted me to go to see this guy um, at this wealthy um, 
and Bernie Kornfeld, that name doesn't mean anything to you, but he was a really, really wealthy man. This was his house. It wasn't him. He wasn't my client. So I go to the, it's like midnight, I guess. So I go up there and I'm, I'm met by this absolutely huge, gigantic guy. I was probably about six, five and probably weighed about 400 pounds. Okay. Wow. I never had sex with him. We went up to his room and we talked and then he got hungry and he wanted to go down to the kitchen. So we went down to the kitchen and he fixed this elaborate breakfast, you know, and he just, he was like eating for an hour, just anything, just devoured it. Right. So um, then he decides he needs a couple of sandwiches to go back up to the room, you know, to keep, to, I guess, to, you know, tide him over to his next meal. And, um, we opened the kitchen door and the lights were off and he says, Oh shit, the, the alarm's on. We, we have to be very careful because Bernie will wake up and, and he'll get mad because I'm not supposed to have a girl here. And I said, oh, okay. So he says, okay, this is what we're going to do. You get down on your hands and knees and I'm going to put the sandwich on your back and we'll crawl to the stairs, but you got to keep your head down because otherwise you'll wake him up. So, here we are. It's, and it's a huge house and it was a long crawl. <laughs> so there we are crawling along and I'm like, where's, you know, he was in front of me. I said, where's the stairs? I can't see anything. All I could see is the light coming in from one of the windows coming through the crack of his butt. <laughs> Good picture, right? So anyway, um, we're crawling along and all of a sudden there's a little dog that comes out of nowhere and starts licking my feet and I scream. And of course I got up and there goes the sandwich. There goes the alarm. I mean, it was just like, oh gosh. <laughs> so um, of course, Bernie Cornfield came down the stairs and said, what's going on here? <laughs> and and my, my chubby friend said, uh, oh, nothing. We're just getting some food. But I mean, that was what it was like. I mean, glamorous call girl. <laughs> you know, it was just, it was fun. It was a very interesting experience. That's for sure. Well, very good. Well, thank you so much for um, coming on and sharing all of your experiences. Let's see if we get a couple questions before we end. Where can folks find you other than your books on Amazon? Right. Um, how do we find you? you NormaGeneAmadovar.com. Okay. My name.com. All lowercase, all one word. Perfect. So anyway, nobody has questions. I've just kind of like blown their mind, I guess. I, I charge for that. That's, that's a blood <laughs> right there. Charge good money for that usually. I, absolutely. All right. Well, it was a pleasure to meet you and hear all your stories. And I will definitely look your book up. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I hope this goes very well for you guys. And I thank you for inviting me on. Absolutely. All right, guys, see you back here in a few minutes with Mikey Wong.